welcome to episode 126 of the weekly weekly podcast thank you very much for tuning in as always wherever you're uh, doing a youtube or the, the um, spotify all those kind of places uh thank you very much for listening to me last week talk a bit about the i talked about the 100 guests that we had so far i was a bit premature with that we've got 98 so far but i wanted to put it in because i've got people coming on so i just wanted to get get it out of the way uh so we could get the guests back in and uh, thanks for humoring me with that one um yeah, and thanks for your support as usual. Uh, we'll get into this week. Um, this week's guest is guest is a boxer and an Olympic bronze medalist, and his name is Aidan Walsh. How are you doing, Aidan? I'm all good, Doug. Thanks a million for having me on. Absolutely. Um, very excited to say that uh, the Olympic medalist bit there, uh, <laughs> which we will we will get into. We definitely will get into. I also just before actually we we kind of kick it off. I wanted to say congratulations, co-captain of the uh, Northern Ireland boxing team for the community game or the commonwealth games yes oh, it's a huge honor got announced yesterday myself along with uh carly mcnall who is a fantastic role model and a fantastic leader so it's, it's a great privilege to, to be to be co-captain alongside her on a great team yeah i mean captain in your country because we always hear about it like i suppose in something like football or something like that but uh, any sports person captain of country has got to be a, a massive honor of course i, I was just I'm privileged to be in the position that I'm in because as a kid growing up, I always had so much respect for the captains that I was under. And again, the lessons that I've learned from them is just incredible. Like going out to the Olympic Games and being around top class people and going to the last Commonwealth Games, I was probably one of the youngest and learning of a lot of the people who have been before me as well. So, and then alongside my sister who has so much experience as well, always learning of her. So, I think it's all just about learning and just trying to use the lessons that I've learned that to sort of help the people coming through and and the to just try and motivate everybody as as best as I can. Yeah, and like it obviously speaks a lot for you when they picking you to be the captain. Um, so we always start in the same place, Ed. And could you give us a short history of your upbringing, please? Well, I, I was uh, born and bred in Belfast, in West Belfast. Um, that's actually where I started boxing. I started in St Agnes's Boxing Club which is in the Anderson Town Road. Um, my dad boxed there. He brought me down when I was around seven years of age. Just to try it out, it was, as I say, it was the same club that he was involved in. He boxed there for, for all his, uh, throughout all his whole career. Um, a guy named Sean Canavan was one of the head coaches there. He, he's still uh, the head coach and, and founder of the club. Um, so we just worked under him for, for a couple of years there and it just all started from there, really. Um, like anything, I just had a normal upbringing. Um, I went to school not too far away, um, St John the Baptist Primary School and then La Salle, um, which again isn't too far away from me. So it was just a, a normal upbringing, like, like anybody from, from Belfast, you had to learn how to box. I think <laughs> that was maybe why I was put in the box and you had to learn how to maybe box outside, which isn't the best thing to do. But just in terms of the environment that you're in, it's always good to be able to protect yourself. Um, mm. Again, with my dad being a boxer and my dad going to the same schools that I went to, I think he was preparing me. Um, what would you say subconsciously, mm. to knowing that he that was maybe gonna maybe the same things that he went through in school that I was gonna maybe go through, and maybe that's what led us to the boxing gym. So, but as I say, Derek, it was just a normal uh, upbringing. Um, I was very privileged as one of the great sports psychologists, Bill Beswick, always says. The, the best thing an athlete can have is two good parents. And I was just mm. fortunate to have two great parents. Um, so, yeah, that, that's it, really. Brilliant. Always um, always lovely to hear because we've had so many different types of answers to that question and so many tif- different types of upbringings. But obviously, it's it's beautiful to hear when when people say that about their parents and, and the upbringing in general. Um, and another kind of question, it's, it's always interesting to answer this, or ask this question because uh, it has such a wild range of answers with it. But... Um, so, like, when when do you when did you first become aware of mental health? Um, when I joined the national team. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was just uh, a normal club boxer. I'd always been. I'd been to like say the youth games and stuff. I'd been to like all Ireland. It was like a junior Europeans and stuff for like small periods of time. You were away for maybe a week and and things like that. But first, I noticed it myself was going from training on a day to day basis at home you're say at school you're at college you're coming home you're training or else maybe you're training in the morning you're going to college you're with your friends you're mingling you're at the gym at night you're home to your own comforts your own bed your own home your own family your normal food your rituals and things like that 
and then to go from there in the environment to be an elite athlete mm. overnight, not not prepared. Of course, like the likes of Sport Ireland, the institute have numerous amount of people who can help you. Um, lifestyle, uh, life skills coaches, sports psychologists, mentors, coaches, like everybody you could ask for. Um, but just at the start for me, going in there uh, uh, from a normal club boxer into the national program. For me, that's that's when things started, uh, and I started to get aware of mental health. It's a like I've heard the kind of the the stories before, but more I guess more when I was growing up through even things like I remember watching this old uh, uh, football video. I think it was Case Rasera, maybe it was called, but it was it was the Irish the, the the Republic team going over to Italy for the nineteen ninety World Cup, and it was actually I think it was Kevin Morn who talked about leaving the home so leaving Dublin and, and going over to to England over to London and that idea of being like you said taken away from everything the ritual the routine and the parents as well obviously you know the love of the the family home and stuff and how it took him quite a long time to adapt to that you know at 17 or whatever because it's a quite a young age to to be to be taken away from the home isn't it yeah of course and I, I, I think there is no real way to prepare for it mm. I think especially it, uh, depending how your career goes my career just happened to sort of come at a time where it was right before it was in the middle of the olympic cycle so i actually wasn't in the high performance at the start of, of an olympic cycle i was sort of put in on the middle as number three or four in the program so one going down there unexpectedly because i, did, I got beat in the national championships and then i was asked down unexpectedly and then to be there and feeling almost as if I don't deserve to be here because I'm not the national champion. Of course, looking from the outside in, it's a privilege because back then I could have been saying to myself, I must have some potential if they're asking me to be here. Um, but again, when you're in that sort of bubble, you're sort of, and it's all new to you and you're just sort of going to yourself, what's happening here? What is this going to work for me? Am I going to be down here Tuesday to Friday? Um, I'm going to be staying in a hotel with someone different every week. Mm things like this sort of started to play in your mind and again I had never really shared a hotel room with someone I didn't know of course it's another athlete um but for me it was like I'm going to be sharing a room with someone and then next week maybe someone else yeah. and I'm quite I'm I'm an introvert of course I love talking to people I love sort of mingling and I love getting to know people but I, when I'm in training I love to keep myself to myself I love to focus just on training I love to go back to my room sort of I love to read I love to do different things watch podcasts and things like that so it was all just new to me but again looking back it's what you need to be a high performance athlete mm. but yeah. I just didn't know that at the time because it was all just so new to me but looking back now when I'm not in that environment I say to myself Frig that is the environment that you need yeah. to be a high performer to be an Olympian to be to be high performance really you need to be in that environment and and for me now, looking back as the years went on and I learned more about myself, about mental health, about dealing with things and, and overcoming things, uh, I see it from a different perspective. Yeah. Um, but as I say, when you're in it like that and it's all new to you and the anxieties and the things that got it, it, it can be hard, especially for, for someone young. Of course, yeah. Um, so let me take it back then. So you, you mentioned of your dad bringing you down to the club, your seven, your sister. What age would you, would you have been when you were, when you were, maybe not even when you first started boxing on there, but like when your dad was taking you down there? I would have been seven. Right. He was, he, he, he sort of drifted me in just to see whether I would sort of, if it would have, would have gravitated towards it or would it not suit me or things like that. But I just hooked it. It was just something that I loved to do, I think, as well. There was a good uh, bunch of lads there mm. who I was just fortunate enough that they were all a bit older than me. So even when I went into the school, when I went into La Salle school, when I was 11, the guys who I were training with were all, say, 13 or 14. Mm. So they were well up in the school. So And they were known as, as top-class boxers. So a lot of time in, in, in La Salle, the old La Salle, there was big banks and stuff. And a lot of the first years when you went in, they all would have been throwing down the banks. <laughs> yeah. But I was just fortunate enough that I knew all the boxers. I knew all the older ones. And it was sort of friendly because of the boxing club. So I always got away with it. So <laughs> I was, it was a blessing in disguise. And it was just something that I was friendly with people who were that little bit older than me and who looked out for me when I went to school. So 
it was a, it was really really good that way. But again, because the the boxing club was in a local area, the school was in the same local area, and back then when there was a group of boxers, no one really wanted to mess with it, the older <laughs> boxers. So yeah, I was happy enough. So it worked out good. For sure. And were you sporty in any other, like, was there any sort of sports for you or was it just boxing? My dad had us in, in loads of things, oh, did he? to be honest, Derek. He had us in, he had us in gymnastics, he had us in breakdancing, he had us in swimming, he had us in badminton, handball, wow. basketball. Uh, what else was there? there? There was a number of things, Derek. And he always, he always just had us doing different activities and just things that were, not not so much for sport, but just for activity and just mm. for fun. And um, it was real. I think maybe that's where me and Michaela sort of get our competitive edge from, from being the, that sort of going through them childhood activities together and sort of have another sister as well who's competitive too. Um, so I think that's where it comes from. But we were in a lot of different sports, so, so we were there, yeah. And that that kind of competitive thing, it's an interesting thing, like, I, I'm uh, I do jujitsu. So when I when I do it like myself and my um my some of the lads compete and some of us don't compete. So when I'm I don't compete because I'm don't see myself as competitive in person or in any way, but then some of the other lads are competitive all the time, even when they're in training, they're very competitive. Sorry, Derek, like, you're just broke. I've been breaking up. Can you hear me? That's all right. I'll keep I'll keep I'll keep talking until we Till you come back in. Is it your ears? Is it those? Are they are they working for you? You're gone on this end from me in. I'll car- I'll carry on talking while we're while we're doing. Um I wonder is I wonder is this your uh, your earphones? Are they dead? Oh, I do. That's it, mate. Derek, sorry. I'm sorry. Back. Sorry, we're back. That's all right. No, no, don't worry about that. Um, we've had way bigger uh, incidents than that. Just, <laughs> but no, what it was, what I wanted to ask you about, because I do jujitsu, and yes, uh, some of the other lads, um, very, very competitive. Uh, like, um, on uh, on the mats, when they talk about other sports, um, obviously when they're in competition, they ha- they need to be like that. So, did you do you think it was because of all those different sports that you became competitive, or do you think that like your family in general is quite competitive? Um, I think it's more like a healthy competitiveness. Yeah. It's not something, well, maybe when we were younger, it was a bit more always winning and winning. As we've got older, it sort of merged to training in, yeah. instead of winning and trying to outdo each other. Try, it, it sort of merged into like a, a healthy sort of competitiveness where we help each other, we push each other instead mm-hmm. of actually competing against each other. Um, and I think as I was just, as, as I say, gaining more experience, gaining more knowledge in sport, sometimes competitiveness can actually go against you, it's especially in, you go, you, you go to camps, you go to, say, sparring camps, training camps, and you're sparring the other guys, and you're you're training alongside people, and you're competing, and a lot of the time, you end up getting injured, because mm. you push yourself so far past, because you're competing against someone else, when really, you should be comparing yourself to yourself, mm. and competing against yourself, so, over the years, I've sort of, as I say, I try to manage that competitiveness, even with Michaela. We're obviously, we're a team and, and we're brother and sister, but we're both individuals and what works for Michaela doesn't always work for me. And to be competitive a lot of the time is, say for instance, like in the gym, I may try and lift a heavy weight, but I'm what, what I'm, Michaela's 57 kilo, I'm, I'm 71 kilo. So having that competitiveness in, in certain places and certain things is actually unhealthy and can actually go against you. So over the years, we've learned that we are individuals. Some things she may do, she may be better at weights, or et cetera, running, et cetera. Um, and like myself, may may not enjoy something as much as what she does and vice versa. So I think it's just finding that balance, Derek, and over the years we we'll have. Yeah, there's something interesting in, in, in that as well. When, when I hear my my coach talking to people when, when they're in the actual competition and I'm there supporting them. And it, you know, I'd see it in boxing as well. When uh, some people go in like full on, like going 10 out of 10, uh, say we'll use boxing for the example, but just throwing hands. And uh, I mean, it's the idea you see it a lot of the time. Someone coming out of the corner, just throwing hands and then just getting caught because they're, they're, you know, their hands are everywhere and they're just right through the middle or whatever. And it's same as I, I hear my coach in jujitsu when, when, 
you know, one of our lads finally gets on top of the guy and then it's like, relax, relax, relax. And it's all that time was the scramble and then it has to go. And I guess it's the same for boxing. There has to be like peaks and troughs and all that. Of course, like a lot of times over the years, like I've seen people, myself included, going into a spar and giving the draw and you end up doing something and you go, why did I push myself that hard? Or you, you get injured because you were trying to load up and you, you hurt your hand or you hurt your elbow or... It wasn't then a sort of like you know from jujitsu, like a lot of stuff is like rhythm and flow, and when you're in that sort of momentum, like everything's just a breeze. But when you're trying to sometimes force something, you're not in that same rhythm, yeah. you're not in that same flow. And I know jujitsu is a lot like that, and they say like a lot of yeah. rhythm, and like all sports, there's that rhythm and there's that sort of that that flow that that sort of that just gauges it almost. And when you're sort of trying so much, I think it's you're not in that, you're actually fighting against it. But I've seen a number of people, Derek, in, in sparring who maybe it was like a technical spar where like say a boxer maybe throw a jab, boxer two maybe has to slip. And it ended up the, the guy who was actually trying to force his opponent and trying to put the pressure on him, he ended up injuring himself and missed out on like a competition or missed out on an event or missed out on a, a crucial training block. All down just trying to be too competitive, yeah. trying to win too much. So I think having that healthy competitiveness against yourself, I think that's that's a massive thing because when you're competing against others, again, someone may have more experience than you, someone may be stronger than you, someone may just have more speed than you. And if you're always trying to compete with that person in their sort of, in their field, mm. you know, it, it's going to it's gonna benefit. It, it may benefit you to the degree, but in the long run, you're just going to go home and you're going to beat yourself up saying, I couldn't catch him or try to hurt him. I didn't knock him out. I didn't. I, did, I couldn't catch him. I, I wasn't. I wasn't strong enough. And that again, with mental health, it just creates a vicious cycle. And yeah, it's something that the competitiveness, I think, in sports can be a big cause of, of mental health. Uh, mm. Because it can go unhealthy. And you look at the likes of the greats. Everybody looks at say like Michael Jordan and stuff, and like a lot of the guys on are, are high profile, and they have this will to win, and they have mm. this huge desire and win at all costs, but what happens that's in sport that's great but what happens when that is outside of sport yeah most likely it's carried across and that it ends up going against them in another way maybe is it a, a gambling addiction or maybe is it alcohol addiction so we're trying to find that balance uh, of competitiveness of just trying to compete i think the more you try and compete the more you're trying to you sort of want to win you want everything i think there's another side to that too and if you're if it's not controlled it can lead you down a very, a very uh, dark road. Yeah, did of you, course. Um, Aidan, just if you don't mind, let me just read out the uh, the old advert as I always have no to. Problem. Contractually obliged, you, you know yourself. <laughs> uh, okay, so Fusion Training Center, Monksland, Athlone, a place to train in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, kickboxing, martial arts, and CrossFit. A great atmosphere with experienced coaches and a real sense of community. If you want to join the team, find us on Facebook at Fusion Training Center or drop in for a chat. Fusion Training Center. Train like a warrior. We're still doing the the women's. Well, obviously we're still doing it, but we'll be keeping it going. The women's uh, self defense and jiu jitsu, coached by myself. But um, it's great fun. There's more and more people joining every week. And as I say, it's uh, contact um, Fusion, contact myself, and we'll get you sorted out. Um, Aiden, I wanted to ask you about the moment when you qualified for for Tokyo and and what that was uh, what that was like for you. The whole lead up to Tokyo. Derek was something that I had never experienced before, especially with COVID and, mm. well, mostly with COVID because <laughs> yeah. of the way it was. Um, but even in general, the whole process of the Golden Olympic Games is is like no other. Mm. Is, is really is like no other. Like I've been to every other tournament there is and the Olympics is, I think you put the pressure on yourself. Well, there is pressure from yourself, but there's a lot of pressure from other people. Um, so again, we went to the qualifiers in London. That was the first qualifiers. I had my first fight, won my first fight. I was actually walking back to the hotel and a few of the guys were saying, this COVID seems serious. This COVID, mm. like it's, there's, there's a few things that's getting cancelled and stuff. And a few of the lads were saying, no way. Like it's, this is the Olympic qualifiers. This will not get cancelled. So anyway, we were eating and I was sitting down with the nutritionist, Sean Monaghan, and I was, I was eating my food, ready to fight, uh, not the next day, the day after. 
was eating my food and stuff and went back to the room and got a call and just one of the lads was in the or Michaela was in the taxi with uh, someone in the taxi man says the, the seen the event get cancelled she was saying is it cancelled what do you reckon no I was saying no way if you if you won't send it'll not be cancelled little did they know an hour later we got a team meeting down to the reception tournament cancelled we're going home tonight oh. so we're on the on the plane back home um and that was it really and then about three or four months after that the whole team got a meeting um it was on zoom um because we weren't back to national team, team training and everything was cancelled we got a meeting on zoom everyone was around all the ones all the number ones the number twos everybody who was in the program for the for the the qualifiers because they were set to be two qualifiers mm. um and that was the first one. So they would say the number two boxers were hoping maybe they would get a chance to go to the second qualifiers. Um, if the first qualifier didn't go, if the number one didn't qualify in the first first time. And so we could sit down and I uh, would basically get told there was only one one qualifier left. And that was it. And there was a qualifier that, that we were fighting in. So the guys who won that won the first fight, they were to fight whenever the next qualifiers was the the, the, the remaining of the qualifying event was to be uh, resumed, which no one knew. But the guys who were waiting on the second qualifying event, their Olympic journey was over. Mm-hmm. And for me personally, I felt for everybody who was in that position because I could have really easily been in that position myself and the Olympic dream was gone. So what ended up, we knew who we were fighting for the whole year. And... Uh, that was before the, the qualifying event in Paris. So it's weird because that would never happen. For, yeah. It was like almost like you're professional. You're training. You know who you're going to be fighting. Like you're, in amateurs, you used to just go into a competition. You, you weigh in. You get your draw. And you fight over the week. And mm. you fight five different people. Not knowing who you are. Bang, bang, bang. But this was like you know who you're fighting for a year. I was set to, to, to fight the French guy. Um, that, was in the, that was two fights away from qualifying. And... So that would have been at one in the in, in London, and then it was this was my second fight. The French guy was he was really good. He was a great great boxer. He'd, he'd been about for a long time. I remember actually sparring him before in, in a camp oh, a year previous, and he was really good. So I knew the, the whole COVID. I knew that I had to train. I had to keep doing everything right because I knew the how good this guy was. I knew that I have to. I have to be a better boxer than what I was at them qualifiers going into these the, the, this qualifier. Um, so we just trained all through COVID. I was doing runs. I was training crazy, and it just kept me on my toes. It kept me fit. I was probably fitter during that than I've ever been in my life <laughs> because I was doing that much running. Um, but it ended up, Derek. <coughs> we ended up going to the qualifiers, and I was I was it. I, I beat the French guy. The next day after that, I fought the Ukrainian. He was like the top three seed in the tournament. He was he was someone who was like was ranked highly. And I won that. It was a split the season, and that qualified me for the Olympic Games on the same day that Michaela I qualified. Yeah, yeah. So that that I always watch that that video back of after when Michaela runs up to me with the ticket, and oh, it was incredible. Mm. There was just it was just so so much feeling, so much emotions, and it was just something that that moment in itself, I'll probably remember the net the more than any other moment just because. To qualify for the Olympic Games, Derek, is like, you know yourself, like, we used to go into the Holy Family Boxing Club and there was a, a big mural of the Olympic rings mm. and that was, that was the, the childhood dream. The coach always used to say, that's, it, that's the Olympic dream. You want to get your name up there. And that Holy Family at the time had, say, six Olympians and there oh. was names in between each, where the ring was, each ring, the names were. And I had always said to myself, I would love to be to be one of them names and I, I just always stayed with me and the same as Michaela and I think subconsciously that's what was driving us because it was like I always want my name up in them rings I, like I would love my name to be up in them rings because I always remember Hugh Russell coming into the Holy Family his name would have been up there his photo would have been up there standing on the podium of his Olympic mm. his bronze medal and I was always saying I loved when I'm retired I would love to be able to come into a gym and see your name on the Olympic rings and a kid going at the Olympics and stuff, yeah. or what, what was it like? Or your name's up there, I would say 40 years ago. That's class, I would love to do the same and stuff. So, it's sort of like it's, it's something that sort of just sort of rotates. Like, it was Hugh Russell, and, and he sort of inspired me and a lot of the other Olympians. And 
I think subconsciously, Derek, that was what was sort of driving us. But yeah, didn't I, really know. I think you know what? I'm a huge fan of the Olympics. I, I love watching the Olympics, and it's one of those, uh, you know. It's, you know, one of, obviously one of the biggest events with regards to sports. But the idea that, like, I'll sit there and watch anything on the Olympics. Like, I really will because yeah. it's just, it's the Olympics. You kind of have to watch it, you know. But yeah. with boxing being uh, such a, one of the more high profile sports when it comes to, uh, you know, the Olympics in general. But when I see yourself and the others coming out in the green, you know, and the flags are there and the, the Irish are always making noise, which is amazing as well, like, and you talk about that, like when you talk about putting like competitive, being competitive with yourself and maybe pressure and stuff, how much pressure did you feel going into, into it? Or was there any opportunity for you to think like, well, you know, I don't know how many people are expecting me to, to win goals or whatever it might've been. Is there, are you able to think in those terms or is that just so easy for me to say, I suppose? No, Derek, again, you're only human. And I think people see it from the outside as you're this Olympian or you're this, mega sports uh, or super athlete and your your dad's 100% you don't eat no sugar you don't drink fizzy juice <laughs> you eat like you don't eat chocolate and you train three times a day every day and you don't go out at weekends and but it's that's the, f- the furthest thing from the truth because you're a normal person you're a normal human and like everybody would get thoughts of what if I don't qualify mm. what if I don't reach my funding criteria what if things don't go wrong? What if I get injured? And I think other people are, are just better at hiding it. Again, we're all actors in this field and like everything, you're, you, some act better than others, but deep down, we're all susceptible to thoughts and bad thoughts, good thoughts. And, and I think, again, mental health going into tournaments is extremely important. And again, mm-hmm. like your, the girl, uh, Simone Be- uh, Beals, who actually pulled yeah. out of the Olympics with mental health, again, that just shows the vulnerability that athletes are under. Going there, Derek, really, the qualifiers were a month before the Olympic Games. Mm. So usually you could be qualified previous Olympics a year before you had time to train up the Olympics. But this one was the qualifiers and then home for a few days, back to national team training and then away to the Olympics. Mm. So for me, it was just all of a sudden, again, it was like, what's happening? Like all of these thoughts and you're just going to yourself, just normal and again it was summer and it was something it was just you're away from your family people mm. don't see that you're away from your your girlfriend you're away from your parents your sisters your loved ones for a long period of time we were away near seven weeks Derek yeah. in in Tokyo so a lot of these things come into factor and again it's a privilege to be doing it again and it's it's an absolute honor but at the same time it is hard and there is sacrifices that have to be made in order to reach your goals. And I'm just really, really fortunate that I was lucky enough to get a medal because every other boxer is that close. And there's a lot of, boxer, a lot, a lot of boxers who deserve more than a bronze medal. And they're just so, so close. Yeah. I was just fortunate enough that I got across the lane with thanks be to God. And But what about the people that just missed out by that much? I know. Yeah. When you're walking off the plane, Derek, and everybody is has the cameras on you, and it, and it's brilliant. Don't get me wrong, but what about the other guys who mm. just come out and they just go home and they have to go home to their families and no one wants to be interested in them. No one wants to ask them how are they or how do you feel or what's your plans now. It's just and it's hard because I was in that position many times, and I'm sure I'll be in that position again in the future and going to tournaments, coming back. And it's a horrible feeling. It really is when you're coming off the plane so close, so, so close to getting an Olympic medal. And again, what does it come down to? Your whole dream is to go to the Olympics and you qualify for the Olympics. It's the best feeling in the world. But then you want something else. Mm. And if you don't reach that, your whole your whole journey's just forgot about. Yeah. Having The medal is always a bonus. It's just a bonus, it really is. Of course, I'm extremely grateful, but to qualify for the Olympic Games, like it's it's incredible, and to be an Olympian your whole life, yeah, it's 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 unbelievable. It really is, but it's just sometimes you're always want more. Derek, like myself, you get the bronze medal, mm. but you wanted the silver, you wanted the gold, yeah. But if someone had to say to you this time last year, you'll be an Olympian, you would have says, yeah, hey, I'll take that with COVID and everything that's happened. You would have says, 
I'll take that any day over anything. And like Rory McIlroy says out at the Olympics, I never wanted to come third so much in my life. Mm. That's how much you can miss out on Olympic men and that's how much athletes want it. And I just, I'm fortunate enough, and I, I honestly mean that with complete humility, that I was lucky enough to get a medal and you just feel a lot for other people because I was in that position as well. And it's hard, Derek, it's hard. I wonder, like, how much can, can I or, or, you know, people... um outside of you know being an olympian and stuff understand that idea of the kind of disposable nature really of the ones who didn't get the medal and and it's it's you know when you're watching the the olympics it's so easy to get caught up as a viewer to the gold the gold silver and bronze you know and who's on the podium and all that and it, uh, this country's got this many medals fine and that's that's great i know i understand that but the fact that when you think of the amount of people who have ever been in the world and the amount of, the, of that have been olympians it's a yep. tiny, tiny, tiny amount of people. Yep. And then when you see them and it's, it's irrelevant of the, the sport or what it takes to, to actually do the sport, but just the time, um, effort and the skill levels that goes in from, from the athlete's part. But then, like you've mentioned, your parents, like them as well, and all your family in between who also sacrifice things, it's, it becomes this kind of huge thing. And it is very very sad and unfortunate that the people who don't quite make make it to the podium are kind of forgotten about and kind of left behind in a way yeah of course it's people as you say people don't see that side of it mm. because your focus is on the winners everybody loves talking about the winners everyone yeah. loves talking to the winners <laughs> and and that's and that is life and it's, it's hard Derek and I know as I say I've been in that position before coming off the back of a plane and no one wants to know you and it's extreme it's, it's normal everybody as i say everybody loves to be a, around a winner and of course and that's that's the way it is but from i've got back from the olympics it's you, hugh russell always said to me an olympic medal would change your life mm. and, and i never believed it in a, in a way of like, what do you mean to change your life the degree it has changed my life but it, to a de- another degree i don't want it to change my life i wanted to be i want to be a normal person, mm-hmm. which I am, and of course, it's it's Olympic medal, and you get a wee bit of fame from it, and then you go back to normality. But for me, Derek, and I, and this is the God's honest truth. Of course, being an Olympian and things like that is is great, but sometimes a lot of people can do that too. But what type of person are you behind yeah. it? What do you do with it? What 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 help do you give out from it? Who do you? who do you sort of motivate to be the next generation or who do you speak out about with maybe mental health and who can you help that maybe he says he's an Olympian and he's talking about mental health he's saying that he has has thoughts that he doesn't want to maybe do this or maybe there's a lot of pressure I don't want to go to the Olympics maybe and and things like that and a young child seeing that who's pursuing that dream going I felt like that going down to my old Ireland final and you go that's actually normal to feel like to feel like that because like Derek, I remember going to the boy two all Ireland final, and I was driving down the Anderson Sound Road, and there was a guy at the at the taking out cash from the the bank machine, and it was a, it was a Saturday morning, and I said to myself, I was only a kid, as I said, I was only twelve years of age, and I said to myself, I would do anything to be that man standing there taking out that cash, going through a normal day, yeah, than going down here to the fight in the all Ireland final. And that's a God's honest truth. And I went down and I won, and it was great. And after it was like, oh, no, I got that's brilliant. But I remember driving down, and I was at twelve years of age. Mm. And I looked at that person, and I remember, I remember the same cash machine and stuff. It was. And I remember going, I would do anything to be that person, just to have a normal day and in, in, in life to get up and go to the bank machine and go get breakfast and to be a normal person. Of course. So someone to look at that and go, that's normal. It, it, it is completely normal, but that's your body trying to protect you in a way because you're going to compete against another person who's essentially looking to punch you in the face. And that's your yeah. body trying to get out of that saying, no, no, we don't want to do that. Why would we want to do that? Um, and again, it's just sort of accepting it and learning more about it as you go on. That, but Derek, I've been fortunate enough mm. really to work with really some great people, psychologists and, and coaches and people that have helped me. And there's been a few psychologists who, one in particular who, really changed my life immensely after the Olympic Games. Um, and there's just, it's, I've been really fortunate to be around great people and 
and just learn like as i say like when i'm speaking here and i'm saying certain things it's it's down to these people who have mm-hmm. have helped me sort of learn this knowledge and learn what way to deal with things so i've just really been fortunate to work with really which top is, class people which is great and you know obviously i want to wanted to ask you about how you were mentally after the games because you won a bronze medal and <laughs> something you're very very proud of uh, and there was the the kind of the infamous injury at this stage. It's become an inf- infamous injury, but a, an injury that was it came about a very innocuous celebration that someone who's young, you know, young, fit and healthy would do every day and nothing, you know. And how how are how were you mentally after that? Because obviously, still have the bronze, but it stopped for anybody who doesn't know. It stopped you from going into the the semi final, um, and fighting for the silver and maybe potentially the gold. Yeah, Derek, it was, I think personally, looking back, and even from after the Olympic Games, I think personally that was my body breaking down. Mm. That was the start of my body breaking down. I actually had a torn uh, ligament in my hand as well throughout the whole right. Olympics. Again, I think was due to my body breaking down. Um, after the Olympics, uh, so that was the two ankles I had done. Um, then I got back, I had to get surgery in the next three months after the Olympics on my hand. Then I got back in the first fight I had back, I fractured my hand. Oh, man. So, and then the, the surgery didn't, uh, the, the operation didn't heal the way it should have healed. And I think again, that was my body just crying out to, to slow down. I think the pressure of the Olympic Games, as I said, is like no other. And that was my body telling me that you need to, slow down you do you think to... that was sorry Aiden, do you think that was the, you you mentioned about the month before having the fight and then going back to the, the the national campus do you think that's part of the reason for it well Derek the reason for me to get to the Olympics was basically down to Bernard Dunn yeah okay because who, as I say who is a great man and I, I thank him so much because for what he done and the decision that he made put me in place to qualify for the Olympic Games did, did he even get to the Olympic Games because, as I say, when I first went to the national program, I was, say, number three or number four. So there was a few guys ahead of me who were set to go to the Olympic qualifiers, who were national champion, who were reigning champion, like, numerous times and stuff. And Bernard Dunn was the one that seen me and perform in the national championships and says, would you like to come down to the high performance? And that was the start of it for me. Again, we were doing assessments, and I wasn't even the champion. And we were doing assessments every week with the champion and with the other guys who were ahead of me. And all of a sudden, they, they held a meeting and Bernard called me in. He says, we're picking you to go to the World Championships. And I says, what? He says, yeah, we really believe in you and your, your ability and, uh, and what you can do. And we've chosen you to go to the World Championships and represent Ireland and uh, one of the highest competitions in the world. And I said, you, 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 you're, you mean me? And he says, of course. And one of the coaches actually said to me, you're not happy? And I says, uh, why, why are you picking me? I'm not even the champion. I, I, and I was under once in the national championships. I hadn't done anything under national senior. And I was like, why, why are you picking me? There's a, there's a champion who has been set basically and sort of a lot of the, the high-regarded boxing analysts had said, like on coverage, that whoever wins like the national championships at that weight on certain year will be guaranteed to get a medal they're that good and I was saying to myself oh, like, do you believe in me that much and Bernard says Aiden we have full trust and we have true faith in you so that's why I have a huge amount of respect for Bernard Dunn because if he like that for him was a huge decision because I wasn't even as I say number one I wasn't I'd only come on to the programme <laughs> so that started and then I went to the world championships I won a fight and then I fought Pat McCormick in the, in the prelims. So I was my second fight in and it was, I lost it on a 3-2 split. And for that there, that gave me the confidence to go, I am, I am at that level. Mm. As I say, he went on to win a silver medal. And for me and the coaches even, and, and, and Zar, John Conlon and Dima and Owen, they, they were said, look at the performance that you put in there. That is the reason why we picked you. That is the reason why we brought you. So I was all chuffed and I was like, oh, this is incredible. So we came back and then the national cha- the national championships happened. Again, I wasn't national champion. Uh, there was a reigning national champion there. 
and I, I ended up facing him in the quarterfinals. So it wasn't even like the, like the final or no, it was the reigning champion against me only coming back from the World Championships. It wasn't even a final or it wasn't even a, a semi-final, but it just shows you how high a standard the national championships are. And I was lucky enough then to win and then to go on and win the whole tournament. And that, that sort of set me in motion then to go to the, the qualifiers and it just was like a snowball effect, uh, Derek. And that's where it all started. But Bernard's done the decision to say, we want to bring you and for him to have confidence in me and the coaching mm. staff to have confidence in me. That brought out confidence in me getting into the ring knowing that I'm up there with one of the best in the world. And then that's how it all sort of came about. Yeah. And like, how, how far can you look ahead? Because I always find that like, you obviously got the um, Commonwealth Games uh, coming up in July, end of July. And then obviously Paris is another couple of years time, but like, it's all, it seems from, from our chat, like it always seems to be constantly on the go. Yeah. I've actually started, Derek, to sort of not look ahead in, in a sense right. because in a way, of course you set goals and there's goals that you want to go maybe the next Olympics, the next Commonwealth and whatever down the line. But for me, and a huge part of sort of my recovery after the Olympics and getting back to normal was I practiced a lot of mindfulness. I, I, I was getting into mindfulness mm-hmm. and a lot of things like mindfulness meditation and stuff and being about in the present moment and things like that. And something that I really sort of want to improve on is improving the things that matter the most. Sometimes we're always looking ahead. You go to a tournament and you're always looking at the medal. You're always looking at the next thing. You're looking at the, the gold medal. You're looking at, sometimes you're even looking, as you say, the next Commonwealth Games are will I be about for the next Olympics? You only got to this Olympics and you're mm-hmm. talking about two Olympics down the line saying, yeah. I want to qualify for the next ones. So for me, I think just, in life now, for me personally, if you can do the, the small things right consistently mm. in the present moment, things will just snowball effect. And again, of course, who do, everybody wants to win the gold medal. Everybody mm. wants to win win medals at international tournaments and get on the funding and, and be on the national team and drive the nice car and not have any financial worries. Of course, that everybody loves that. But sometimes you're always looking for the destination. You actually miss out on the journey. I mean, you look back, the journey is the best part because realistically you always remember when you're talking in years to come and you'll, you'll meet someone you say, remember we shared a room in Italy or remember we shared a room in the Olympic village and we were going to the venue and or remember the, 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 the canteen in the village. We used to go in in the mornings and eat this and have a coffee. And, but something when you're in that moment, you forget and you don't appreciate yeah. them moments because you're just too busy looking at the medals, at the performances. You forget to enjoy the moment. And it's like anything, if you, if you enjoy what you're doing, if you enjoy the moment, if you enjoy your surroundings and you're just grateful for what you have, I think it's just, it's like a snowball effect and it just continues to go and go. And of course, there's going to be obstacles. There's going to be times when things aren't going to go well for you. But again, that's you looking into the pre- into the future. You're not in the present. You're saying, oh, I'm injured, but I can be out for the next few months. Again, working with a psychologist that I work with who has helped me immensely, um, it's it's there's just so much to learn, especially from from psychologists and people out there, lifestyle skills coaches who are willing to help you. And I think it's amazing, Derek. Yeah, I've been very I've been very very lucky in having people on. Um, well, not only people coming on to talk about that kind of things, but actually going to psychologists for myself for my own anxieties and stuff like that, and realizing about um how. I may have lost like a lot of the the moments because I've been anxious about the future rather than being in the present, which is which is something obviously at the time I had no knowledge of of it even happening. You know, it was just happen- things were just happening and I wasn't being there in the in the in the present. But um, and speaking of the future, <laughs> uh, do you uh, do you have any thoughts of uh, going pro at any point? Again, I don't really. I don't really know, Derek, because. Okay. Again, there was a few people on to me after the games about going pro and things like that, but I just feel like the journey for me started a bit later later than others. Again, like I turned 25 there after the games, and mm-hmm. so sort of my, my going into the national team, the journey of an elite athlete only really started around 23. Where there's been people who've been on the program since they were 17, 18, <laughs> and they're sort of building their way up and they're winning medals at that age. And sometimes, again, you're comparing, you're looking at them going, 
they're only 17 and 18. I wasn't winning medals that I was 20, 23, 24. You're going, that just shows you the talent that's there, but yeah. it's, it's amazing. But I don't really know, Derek. Again, I, only, I got on funding and stuff, obviously, from the, the Olympics. I'd never been on funding in my life in terms of having an income and getting paid for what you what you love to do. It's 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 something that you dream of as a child. Um, but again, you're, the mind's a, a weird thing. You always want more. You always, no matter how much you get, you're always saying, I want more. You want this and you want that. So for me, I'm just extremely grateful, really, um, to be in the, the, the position that I'm in now because there's hundreds and hundreds of athletes across Ireland, across the world, who would love to be in this position I'm in. If I'd have been, when I walked into the program and if I had been looking at myself then, then I, mm. I would have been saying, that's the position that I want to be in. Yeah. That's what I want to be, have. Being an Olympian, first and foremost, above anything, they get a medal and they get on funding. It's it's amazing. And again, your man can always, you always do want more and you can, you're can you always focusing on the next one, the next one. But a lot of the time, I think that's where the anxiety starts and that's where mm. you, the trouble happens because you lose that sort of gratitude of what you wished for what you had that you have now you wish for that one day mm. and now you've got it but you're not happy because you want more so learning just is actually enjoy it and just more and and i think if, if people can enjoy it enjoy it more enjoy their sport a lot of the time Derek, and it still can happen to me and it still does happen to me i can take things serious in terms of i need it like i want to train i want to do everything right i want to do everything meticulous i want to have everything in order and eat the right things and go to bed at this time and of course but sometimes again that can be a bit of a downfall for you because then you lose the side of enjoyment you go to yourself when i was a kid i was just enjoying it i was a little i don't know for the fun i performed you weren't getting injuries you weren't you weren't you were just happy yeah <laughs> and i think if you can sort of bring bring that back in, into what you do and what you love again I'm saying this like this is all my own ideas. This is no, I understand. Of yeah, people that sort of helped me to, to get to this point. But again, if you can sort of incorporate these things from outside of sport and sort of find a balance of 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 enjoyment or fun, mm. if you look at the likes of the great the great soccer players, the great the great athletes, it almost look like they're just in the zone. They're enjoying it. They're just they're happy to be there. Mm. Again, now, not everything's what it seems. It could be complete opposite when they leave the pitch or when they leave this, the arena. But if you can bring that sort of child like play yeah. back into your sport, I think it, it's it has huge benefits. And I think we're just always we're, a lot of the time. It's great and it's important to be a high performer. You always want to be high performance. And again, culture for me and and your values are a huge thing. But Essentially, enjoying it doesn't really go against that. People think, oh, like, I can't enjoy it or I can't have fun because I'm a high performer. I'm, a, I'm an athlete. Yeah. I'm a high performance athlete. I do everything right. I go to bed at the right time. I eat the right time. And then it's almost like, I actually can't have fun. Yeah. But you can. If you, the more fun you incorporate into your sports, into your life, it's only going to benefit you. It's only going to prepare you. It's only going to make you do better. So, it's again I'm I'm saying like it's all me came up with us. It's no just, it's, it's people that I've worked with. No, but it's 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 very important that you talk about it as well because you talk you know, we mentioned you about you becoming a co captain and for young younger people to look up to you in that sense and uh, boxers from young boxers from all over Ireland to hear that, whether it's your own ideas or you know, talking to psychologists or former boxers, whatever it might be, it doesn't really matter, you know, the message is the most important thing, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. And are you someone actually who, who like a student of the game, like are you someone who likes to look at old, you know, legends, uh, boxing, um, on YouTube and that? Of course, maybe too much, Derek, oh to be God. honest. I actually probably. Get told off for maybe doing too much outside the box and saying mm. like one of the guys I, I'm working with at the minute is saying like like he, yeah, he's a fantastic guy but he's, he's unbelievable what he does like like them all um saying you need to go back to your room and put on the TV and watch Carney and Street because too much of something is a mm. bad thing and having that sort of downtime you can't think about sport all the time you can't well you can but it'll not be very helpful for you yeah. because again burnout and things like that but just having a bit of normality in your life for me after the olympics i think that's what i needed the most 
was just a bit of normality, a bit of time to be a human being. And mm-hmm. like I took, uh, like I took four weeks off, Derek, after the Olympics, and that was before the surgery. And I didn't once want to go back to the gym. And and that mm-hmm. was the first time in my life that I never actually says I can't wait to get back training. And that, that for, and because of the high demands of the Olympics mm-hmm. and the high pressure and just the body just needing the rest and recovery, I, I wasn't. I, I says this is the first time in my life that I'm not dying to get back in the boxing gym. And over time, we're working with people and doing certain things. I got that love back because mm. I went back doing it for what I, I started it for, for the love of it. Not for, of course, you want to win, but not for trying to be the best in the world. Mm. Of course, we all want to do that, but I, I started for the love of it. When I went down, when my dad brought me down when I was seven years of age, I was punching the bag and I was laughing and there's videos and you're just going, why are you laughing? But it's because it's enjoyable. Someone's recording, Michaela's recording you and <laughs> your mates are shouting and you're enjoying it. So I got the, the love of it back again. Mm. And I think when you do something you love and you're in a good environment around people who you like to spend time with and again, the greatest coaches in the world, Derek, I think, are the best psychologists. Mm. And for me, that's what I've learned over the years and people who can who can in a way shape you to be a better person yeah not just always focusing on train hard train hard train hard rest the weekend train hard but if, if you can sort of it's, it's sort of like a reverse psychology it's almost like when someone would say to me for instance someone would say you need to train at the weekend i would say to myself i don't want to train now but see if you hadn't have told me that <laughs> i would have trained anyway yeah so the best coaches in the world and the best people in the world know how to man manage and I think that's extremely important because it is it's like anything when you're a child I always remember my dad I, we were in the kitchen and we went out the, into the garage to get something she said don't put your hand on that cooker and when he came in I went put my hand on the cooker and it's the yeah. same thing it's the same philosophy of I can use go about saying like if someone's in a ring or someone's training and you're you're constantly shouting don't do that don't do this don't do that it's almost reaffirming to do it yeah yeah Instead of saying things in certain ways, and that's what I, even the psychologist that I'm working with, it's the way they say things, and and it's the way they present themselves in a way that you go, these guys are, are they're like, they're like superhuman beings because there's so much knowledge in any team that I'm talking and working on. And again, I'm just fortunate to do Sport Ireland and Sport and I, you get to work with with, with top class people, but. For anyone out there, again, who think maybe talking to a psychologist or talking to a, a mental coach or a lifestyle skills coach, people are afraid to get that direct mm. because they almost see it as a weakness. They see it as if there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing. I don't need to. I don't need to improve my mental skills. I won an All Ireland title and I didn't see anybody or I got this or that. But it's not about that. There's going to be parts of the road that's coming mm. that you're going to need certain mental mental skills to overcome. And I think it's it's a massive, massive thing. And I'm I, again down to my parents, my girlfriend, my girlfriend's parents, my sisters, like the sports psychologists, the coaches. These are the people that shape you as a human yeah. being. These are the people who who mold you. And so it's it's important to be around people you love and the people you trust. And I think because ultimately that's the people that that are shaping you, and that's the, the person you become through the traits that these people have taught you. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and and does the question I always ask, and it ties in perfectly what we were just chatting about there. But what do you like to do in your uh, spare time? One would be fishing. I love fishing. Really? Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. I took that up before the Olympics. Um, I love kayaking. I love I have a wee caravan down in the Andrum coast up in um nice. up in Andrum. I'm gonna be a place called Carnlock. Me and the girlfriend go down there. I actually got the caravan the week before the Olympic Games. <laughs> and I remember going to the Olympic Games and it was summer and the week we were leaving, it was a scorching weekend. It was, I mean, the sun was splitting the trees and I was like, I should be in my caravan here. And, but then looking back now, you're going to the Olympic Games yeah. so you're going to yourself, right? There'll be plenty more time when you get back. Yeah. So I love doing that. I love spending time with my girlfriend. I love spending time with my family. I love walking the dog. I love getting out in nature, um, going walks, things like that. But I, lo- I love kayaking. I love fishing. Mm. And, I just love, I love outdoor stuff. I love Very kind of, the- kind of mindful uh, activities as well. Because like, um, it's funny when I was quite young, 
obviously Athlone is uh, it's on the Shannon, so you know loads of people fish here, and I fished a couple of times, and I I didn't like um you know you catch the fish, I didn't like actually grabbing the fish to take it off the hook. That was yep. my thing, you know. Yep. But everybody talks about it this amazing thing for your head, and I, it's I should have tried it, or I should try it. Not that I should have, but I should try it for that reason alone. Do you find it very beneficial for your mind? Of course, they, they actually say there's a quote, and it says. It's not about the fish to catch. It's about the experience that you gain from fishing. It's about yeah. the stillness that comes from it. It's actually not about the fish catching the fish. Of course, that's a, maybe a benefit when you yeah. catch it. But I'm the same. I, see, when I go fishing, I feel guilty as I see when I catch a fish, I feel guilty, and I actually enjoy it more when I don't catch it and I just sort of I'm chilling out and stuff. But honestly, Derek, there's nothing better than being out on a still water on a kayak mm. with a fishing rod. <laughs> For me. It's incredible, but I'm lucky enough that I have a friend, Brandon, who is into that as well. So when you're able to do it with someone, it makes yeah. the experience a bit more better. Again, sometimes it's not about the, the what the activity you're doing; it's about the people you're you're doing it with. So I'm fortunate enough that I have a friend that that, that loves doing it. Um, but it's incredible. Like it's just something. Again, you're away completely from sport. Mm. You're just in the moment. You're you're focusing on the, the fresh air, on the water, on the kayak, on on the paddles, and you're in the present moment again it's something that i think it, it attracts people because when i always put it up on instagram or when i put it on, on social media the amount of boxers that text me and say this is class where is this where can i get a kayak <laughs> what what do you fish for and i was actually fortunate enough it was brandon irvine before i knew how to fish brand brandon had said to me before the olympics i told him i was out in the kayak and he said to me you should go fishing and he says frig i wouldn't know how to fish <laughs> yeah and uh yeah, just get a wee rod and get a few fellers and I done it on the kayak and I caught for the first time and I was like, Frig, that's amazing. And then that sort of started me off. And then me and me and my friend would go about different places and do different bits of fishing and stuff. So it's it's amazing, Derek, what what these things can do for you. Just, it's a bit of stillness when yeah. the constant like, again we're always talking about looking ahead, looking ahead, looking ahead. But you're just in that present moment and to be there and the the sort of to not have any worries about I'm fighting next week or I need to watch my weight yeah. or I, I need to be in training at a certain time tomorrow morning or I should be training now. A lot of these thoughts drain your energy a lot of the time and to be just doing their normal activity with as a normal human being and it's amazing. It really is. And to think some people go to, uh, you know, kind of mindful thing to go boxing as a, as their hobby is funny as well, you know the kind of the full circle but it seems yeah. that like when i talk to to the young lads in where i, where I train they absolutely love it as a, as a kind of a, a as a hobby or maybe something something more as they go along yeah, yeah but like even the, the, there's loads of like there's loads of different things that you can do mm. like not just even fishing like you can just get out because again the whole thing of being a lead athlete you're you're training and then you're in the bedroom, you're training and you're in the bedroom all week. You can't be running about the shopping centers. You can't be running about for coffees with your mates or meeting up with your mates at night. Well, you can, but you'll not get very far. <laughs> but in terms of you want to do well, you have to be sort of, again, you have to have some type of enjoyment and some course, type yeah. of downtime. But when when you're in the serious grind of, of a training camp, your focus is training and sleeping and, and, and eating in between. So to have those times where even maybe like after a hard week training, you're going to out. It's like, and there's, because we would always do like an active recovery run at the weekend. So even a like a like bit of kayaking and stuff, like it's extremely beneficial, mm. not just mentally, but physically too. You're, you're moving and even if it's fishing, you're moving. And I, I think you just, but it's just something about it. I think it's, again, it's just that being mindful, being in the present moment. And there's lots of other activities that you can do also. But for me, they're just the ones that, that I love and, and love to do course and listen i want to obviously wish your you and the team the very best luck in the commonwealth games and obviously we'll be following you in the lead up to the next olympics as well which is very exciting aiden it's been it's been a, a genuine pleasure chatting you today thank you Derek. you too yeah thanks very much for having me on it's an absolute pleasure really that's is. all right listen stick with us for just a minute i'll close it out i'll take a quick promo photo and then we'll be on our way is that all right 100 nice so uh, I also want to thank John, who I always do for the tech support. 
I always thank my mum, my dad, uh, granddad, Jaron Calvin. Uh, we're on YouTube. Subscribe if you would. And we're on the uh, Instagram and Twitter. You think I know this stuff by now. Facebook. Uh, we're on Spotify, Apple, Anchor, Google Podcasts, and all the other podcasts that I never really remember. And thanks to everyone else for tuning in. Um, and as the title of the podcast suggests, we'll be back next week. Aiden, once again, thanks a million. Thanks very much, Derek. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Have a good week. Thank you.